jump right in. Um, I thought even before I should uh, begin one of the homeworks, I should probably finish the example that we started in class because I realize some of you guys may have a little bit of challenge from there. So um, in this particular example, uh, it reads air is adiabatically and reversibly compressed. So when you hear air is compressed, you can say, well, okay, I probably have a compressor, right? Keywords here, adiabatic uh, and reversible. Reversible. Okay, adiabatic means Q is equal to zero. Reversible means that sigma is equal to zero. Um, from 0 0.2 bars um, at 250 Kelvin to two bars. Sorry, the handwriting doesn't appear to be good on this. Um, in a steady flow system. So our assumptions, steady flow, neglect, PE and KE, since it didn't specify. Uh, it also told you in the problem statement to assume K is equal to 1.4. Uh, and we have some workflow, of course, in there. What is the um, outlet temperature and the work per unit mass? So what they're asking is work per unit mass and what is this T2? Um, I think we already showed the energy balance is the same. Now note, this is not asking you to find the isentropic efficiency. And remember that isentropic efficiency uh, doesn't mean that the system is isentropic, you're comparing it to one which is isentropic, which would be the ideal case. Um, a couple of you guys kind of got a little faked out by that on the quiz most recently. Um, but this is, as it states here, adiabatic and reversible, which means this indeed is isentropic. So S1 does equal S2. Now, where can we go from here? Uh, we will do our um, full energy balance nonetheless. Um, so energy, well just for the heck of it, let's do a mass balance. Uh, of course this is in steady flow so M1 is equal to M2. For our energy balance uh, we have work is equal to the mass uh, times H1 minus H2. That's H in minus H out. Now they are asking in terms of work per unit mass, so we can totally just convert this to work per unit mass equals H1 minus H2. For the entropy balance, and I will take a moment uh, again just to remind and write the general entropy balance right here just to make sure everybody's got it. Um, nobody feels like they're left out. Um, in derivative form, or I'm sorry, in differential form, it's uh, D S C V. Oh, nice. Over D T is equal to the sum of all Q J over T J for all J plus the sum of all mass flows in and their respective entropies minus the sum of the mass flows out with their respective entropies plus sigma dot. And the same rules apply. If sigma is equal to zero, it's reversible. If sigma is uh, greater than zero, it's irreversible, but possible. If it's less than zero, it's impossible. Okay, so let's pare this thing down in this case. Um, this is a steady flow open system. At that point, there cannot be any change with respect to time in the control volume of entropy because it has to remain the same. Uh, well, what else is true? We did say that it was reversible, so we know from our assumptions that sigma is equal to zero. Okay, that's good. Stuff does come in and stuff does go out. But we did say this is an adiabatic system, which means there is no Q. So that's also going to go to zero, leaving us with a relatively simple expression. And we can see when we end up with 
zero is equal to m. And because m1 is equal to m2, we could just distribute that out. S1 um, minus S2 in this case. Uh, we can divide by mass and find that the same conclusion is true. S1 is equal to S2. Okay, good. So we feel comfortable about that. We have two key things that we're going to need to be able to move forward. We need to uh, have one last assumption, and that's that um, the ideal gas has a constant Cp. Okay, now, how do you use the ideal gas equations that I covered in class? Yes, they seem evil, sorry. Um, you will kind of sort of get used to them a little bit. Um, don't forget them. Uh, I'll actually create a little summary pack right here of them. So we know the basic one. We know the variation with molar volume. We have the variation with specific volume and R not R bar. We have our relationship for internal energy. We have our relationship for uh, enthalpy and for a relationship between the two respectively. We have the connection for S, Cp over T dt minus R over P dp. Uh, what am I missing here? I feel like I left something out. Ah, yes, of course. And the relationship with K. Good. Okay, so powered with that, um, you should be able to get through most of these. There's a couple little interesting things that happen that I'll walk you through just in case you didn't see them or didn't want to evaluate some of these integrals, which sometimes can be kind of nasty. Of course, you have the total option. You can either memorize them or learn to evaluate them, whichever one's easier for you. Um, sometimes can be helpful to know how to evaluate them. Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking and just finish the problem up. So we need H here, clearly. And if you don't see what clearly is, basically that our energy balance has an H1 minus H2, which looks and sounds a lot like DH or delta H, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's probably going to be like a direction that we're going to need to take. And remember that uh, for the case of, for uh, U and for also for H, it only dis depends on temperature in both of these cases. So that's kind of like what the gist of what the ideal gas is uh, summarizing. So we know this is an open system. We have to evaluate uh, H. Cp, as I just said, was one of the constants. And that's very important here because now Cp appears outside of the integral. Of course, constants just come right out of integrals. So when we evaluate this, uh, it sort of becomes more as a delta. So we can think of this as H2 minus H1 is equal to Cp and then some delta here, T2 minus T1. Okay, well that doesn't look too, too bad, uh, mainly because this looks very similar to this up here. So we're gonna kind of remix these equations, being kind of careful, as you'll notice this said H2 minus H1, not H1 minus H2. Um, we're gonna end up with W over M, is equal to Cp T1 minus T2. Okay, well that's good, um, sort of. We sort of have enough information to go forth from here, but not quite, right? We have T1, we still don't know what Cp is, and sort of is 
missing a little bit too much information, right? But we know, do know that it's isentropic. So what can we do with that? We basically have to play with our entropy. Um, and this may not seem very obvious at first because the entropy balance proved that S1 is equal to S2. But sometimes it can be helpful to actually write out the entropy balance and kind of think about what that means. ds is equal to cp over t dt minus r over p dp. Well, we just said over here that s1 is equal to s2. So what we're really saying is that this expression is equal to zero because then when we take the difference, um, that's just gonna fall to zero. That turns out to be pretty important because now I can actually evaluate this integral and get some kind of relationship between the two. So let's see what that's gonna look like. I think a lot of you guys might have been stuck right here and this was that sort of holy grail. So I'll let you soak in this aha moment as I write these integrals. From T1 to T2, we're gonna evaluate CP over T dt uh, is equal to the integral of R over P dp. From, oops, that's not right. Uh, from T, I'm sorry, from P1 to P2. Okay, so again, the idea is there was a DS here, but instead of having, or you can sort of still think of it as there, um, S2 minus S1, we do know that S1 and S2 are equal, so if they're, I don't know, 5 minus 5, we can clearly see that that's going to be a 0. And then all the rest of the equation would apply. So I just move the r over p dp to the other side and evaluate the integral. And that's all we've done. Okay, we have constant cp, right? So we can pull that out. And um, after we evaluate, we're going to get cp natural log of t2 over t1 is equal to r natural log of p2 over p1. And this might also not be particularly easy to remix for you guys, so if you did want to almost remember a second relationship um, that is true in these cases only, please be careful about when you're going to use this. Um, and I guess that's the big danger of just trying to remember uh, remember arbitrary equations. Uh, this looks like it can be used in hundreds of situations, except um, it can only be used in a couple. So try to follow along with the math and see what you could do. Uh, for air, we do know that the molecular weight is equal to 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. Um, so we can get R. Again with this, okay, whatever. Just ignore this big black blob over here. R is equal to R bar over molecular weight. So we have R, and we just need to make that play nice with our molecular weight. So we're going to put it at the bottom, 28.97 kilograms, and we get 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So that's good. We have that. What else can we do? Well. We know CP minus CV is equal to R. So we have our relationship with, with our K. 
And thus, we can kind of do something interesting, putting these two equations together. Um, Cp1 minus 1 over 1 1.4 is equal to R. Or Cp is equal to 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now I know the math can sometimes not be obvious at all on these problems. I get it. It's super weird. Uh, I really don't know what to say. Uh, I know chemistry is a challenge for some people. You guys may not have had instructors that were passionate about it and thought it was cool, but this is uh, what we're dealt here. So if you kind of look back at the equation that we just wrote, we now actually have everything that we need to work with this equation right here. Because we have R, we have CP, we have P2, we have P1, and we have T1. So we have everything except for T2. And that's going to be the key to solving uh, this particular problem. So once we find T2, of course, we'll be able to go all the way back into our energy balance equation located right over here. And we can pretty clearly see that we just have a temperature relationship in CP. And we have calculated CP, so we'll just be able to produce that pretty quickly. It's only a matter, and I think I will write into this little region right over here. It's only a matter of just uh, rearranging this to get T2. T2 is equal to 250 times 2 over 0.2. Please remember that these are all absolute uh, numbers, uh, temperatures and pressures, don't try to put anything else in there, over 1.005. You'll find that T2 is equal to 482.5 Kelvin, um, working that temperature in with that constant Cp, you're going to get uh, the work per unit mass is equal to negative 233.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. An alternative solution might have been as follows. From our entropy balance, where we knew S2 minus S1 was equal to zero, we also have that relationship that S2 naught minus S1 naught minus our natural log of P2 over P1. Uh, would then possibly come into effect here. Because even though S2 minus S1 is equal to zero, S2 naught and S1 naught would not be. And the reason for that, of course, is that it should be somewhat clear that this equation actually looks a lot like the equation that we just used to solve the problem. And that's because it basically relates temperature and pressure uh, through the natural log differential. So what we are saying then is what? S2 naught minus S1 naught is equal to 0 0.8. I'm sorry, that's not right. 0 0.287, just taken from the previous natural log of these two. Two over 0 0.2 bars. If you are concerned about using different types of pressure uh, in instances where the pressure is being divided, you do not need to convert um, so that the pressure units match anything else. I'm going to repeat that very carefully. If you have a division operation for pressures that are both absolute, you do not need to convert them 
to, you know, for example, here we're just using directly bars, kilopascals, or anything else. And the reason that for that is when they are absolute, they just produce a ratio of pressures between those two pressures. This only works if they're absolute and only works if you're dividing. Um, please don't do it at other weird times. 0 0.6608. Okay. Well... S2 naught is then equal to S1 naught plus R ln P2 over P1. So 1.51917 plus 0 0.6608 uh, is equal to 2.1800. At this point, we can basically set up a table. Try to get some interpolation going. This is what we just calculated. Try to look up all these values 480 and 490 and at that point we're going to get fairly similar answers w over m is going to be equal to uh, where am i uh, no let's write t 2 is going to equal 481.1 and W over M is negative 233.6. Um, in our previous example, just I guess I'll write it in blue, we got 482.5 and negative 233.7. And that was kilojoules per kilogram. Just box these. Oops, kilojoules per kilogram and Kelvin. An alternative solution. So here's the bonus material that I did want to mention very briefly. Uh, and it's just a solution strategy, um, again, to use CP average. Um, you may see a problem. So let me just write this down and I guess I'll try to explain it. Um, we want to use CP average. We know that CP is um, a function of temperature. We've proven this. And so typically up until now we've had instances where we get T1 and then we add it to T2, divide by 2, uh, not by T, by 2. And that gives us T average and now we can look up or calculate uh, CP at T average. But in those previous examples, we had some weird stuff, right? Because we didn't know T2. So how could we get T average? And this is just like sort of a, an example of what you can do. In those types of cases, um, we basically do trial uh, and error, iterative solving. So the idea basically looks like this. You are going to guess that um, T average is equal to T2. Can't be too far off, right? We're going to evaluate. C 
cp at whatever that t average is. In this case, it would be the same, right? Because what, t1 plus t2 is uh, divided by two. If we assume that they're the same uh, as t1, for example, or that we can sort of guess some other way, we're gonna be off, but that's okay. At that point, we're going to plug CP into um, the equation and then solve back for T2. And then we're going to basically look and see is T2 calculated um, equal to the real T2? If the answer is no, we can um, just redo this calculation. Basically, now we have a new T2 is equal to T2 calculated, and we can use that in our new T average. And basically, every time you do it, it'll become a little bit closer. So let, let's again just write this as a concept. You didn't know the real T average. Um, so T2 was then equal to T1 is equal to 250 Kelvin. So T average is um, equal to 250 Kelvin. If we look then in table A14, CP is equal to 1.003 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin at 250 Kelvin. We're gonna look at that previous example um, and sort of just quickly evaluate this. T2 is equal to 250 times 2 over 0 0.2, 0 0.287 over 1.003. So T2 actually turns out to be 483.1 Kelvin. Okay, so we're gonna use that as our second iteration. Now, in our T average calculation, T average is equal to 483.1 plus 250 over 2, 366.6K. Okay, um, now when we reevaluate looking at that in table A14, we find that CP is equal to 1.01. .01. And we go through the same math and find that T2 is equal to 480.9K. Usually, that's enough. Um, two times typically evaluates you about as close as you're gonna need for most cases. Um, so, I realize I haven't even started the homework and we're 30 minutes in, but uh, I guess I should probably start and do a couple of those. I have been getting some questions on them, so I'm gonna try to just very briefly go over some of these. Um, so I guess we should at least do one just to make sure people don't get too far off in case they're rather confused. Um, air is taken from 300 Kelvin and one bar. Uh, to 900 Kelvin and 10 bars. And they're basically just asking you to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, in question A, evaluate H2 minus H1 and S2 minus S1 using uh, CP, taken from table A20. Okay, and then they're saying use table A22 and then a table A21. Okay, so uh, I think what I'll also do besides that, just to give you kind of like a sneak preview of what it is I'm gonna be covering. Um, so we're, we should do problem one, homework problem one. Uh, I think homework problem two is just kind of an interesting conclusion that you might like. Um, for the case of 
problem four, I think I'm just going to go over some equations only so that you can kind of work that. And then we will work problem five completely. Let me make a note of what I'm going to do here myself. Okay, so without further ado, so the very first thing you need to do when you see this and you need CP uh, is you need to get CP, I'm sorry, you need to get T average because uh, CP is a function of temperature and thus you need to basically um, have that. So the first thing we're going to do is pretty simple is um, just produce T average, which is uh, the two T's, just T1 plus T2, 300 plus 900 divided by 2. Of course, that's 600 Kelvin. So CP evaluated at T average is equal to 1.051. And for those of you guys playing along at home, crack your book open to table A20. And uh, all you're going to do is look up 600 degrees uh, for the case of air. And you should find that your CP is equal to 1.051. I just pulled this value right out of the table. Nothing special here. Uh, just looking over at the temperature. So, so we're doing okay so far, but we haven't done too much. Um, we know that our relationship for the enthalpy is dH equals Cp dt. So when we integrate, and again, this should start to look familiar, hopefully. Um, H2 minus H1, this is a delta, not in minus out, is equal to Cp T2 minus T1. Okay. Now they asked us to evaluate H1. No, oh, there's no 2 there. H2 minus H1. Uh, so that's good. So basically all we have to do is evaluate this. And what's also nice is we do have T1 and T2. So the only thing we needed was CP, which we now have. So hopefully this doesn't seem too bad for you. 1.051 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times the difference in our temperatures. Oh, that wasn't necessary. So we get what? H2 minus H1 is equal to 630.6 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the first thing. The second thing does tend to be a bit harder uh, just because of the evaluation of that integral. <clears throat> I'll write it out again. S2 minus S1 is equal to Cp natural log of T2 over T1 minus R natural log of P2 over P1. Okay. Um, you look at this and you want to cry, but is it that bad? Do we know CP? Yes. Do we know our temperatures? Yes. Do we know our pressures? Yes. The only thing we don't know is R. And R is very simple to calculate because it's just the gas constant divided by the molecular weight. Please remember that R bar is not equal to R. Just a little booster piece of information. So let's just write all this out. Um, should not be that bad. 1.051. I think this part of my screen's bad. 900 over 300 minus 8.314 over 28.97. You either remembered that from the last class. By the way, I'm not going to expect you guys to ever remember molecular weight, so don't even come to me with the gripe that uh, we have to remember molecular weights. That's always something that's going to be given to you um, if it's needed. So um, please do not worry about things like that. Okay, so at that point we just get S2 minus S1 right out. 0 0.494. Great. 
Not too bad. So that was evaluated using table A20. So we're going to slide on over to table A22 to see an alternative method. Um, and what do I always say? S not is not S. So please don't get into the easy trap of being like, oh, look, S2, now I just use this like a regular table. So, But this is a lot easier to use, this table set, table A22. It does only work for air, um, unless you have them for other tables. Uh, you sort of do, but not too many. But neither here nor there. Let's just kind of work it using this alternative method. So this is part B. We're going to try to solve this using table A22. Um, well, let's make a little table ourselves here. We have temperature, we have H, and we have S0. That's the only thing we can pull out of that table. There's only two temperatures that we're, we have here. We have 900 and 300. So we're going to put them down. We're going to pull our values out. Uh, we have H is 300.19. Uh, at 309.32.93 at 900. And we get S naughts 1.70203, 2.84856. Okay, well, H2 minus H1 seems pretty easy right now, right? H2 minus H1, this is exactly what it looks like 932.93 minus 300. 0.19 is equal to 632.7. Second grade math, super easy. Kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, and we kind of see that that's pretty similar to our original value. Okay, it's doing good. So for S2 and S1, we know that there is a relationship here. And we, again, now have everything that we need. So we just have to reevaluate. Um, two. Now we are going to use the S naughts here that we got from the tables. Uh, so 2.84856 uh, minus 1.70203 minus 8.314 over 28.97. That was the molecular weight of air. Uh, and then the natural log of the quotient of the pressures, S2 minus S1 is equal to 0 0.486 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, that's again pretty close, not too bad. Okay, great. Um, again, I am working fast. Please feel free to go ahead and stop the video and work it yourself. Um, we're now going to do everybody's favorite um, table, table A21. Super fun, you know, because we have such a desire to solve these interesting integrals. So if you look all the way at the top of that table, there's a really awesome equation. Let's go write it out right now because it's so awesome. CP over R bar. Um, is equal to CP over R um, is equal to alpha plus beta T plus gamma T squared plus delta T cubed plus epsilon T to the fourth. We know H2 minus H1 is equal to the integral of Cp dt, evaluated between these two temperatures. So, well, far be it for me to stop the entertainment. Between T1 and T2, we will have then R times alpha plus beta T plus gamma t squared plus delta t cubed plus epsilon t to the fourth dt. 
hopefully everybody can see what I've just done. Give you a minute there. Now all we have to do is evaluate this fun integral and naturally the answer is, I love it when they say that, right? Naturally. What else could this be? t2 minus t1 plus uh, beta over 2 t2 squared minus t1 squared plus uh, gamma over 3 t2 cubed minus t1 cubed plus delta over 4 t2 uh, to the fourth minus t1 to the fourth plus epsilon to the fifth t2 to the fifth minus t1 to the fifth sweet so r is equal to 8.314 over 28.97 as usual t2 is equal to 900 t1 is equal to 300 and we're going to look up air and we find our coefficients um, alpha is equal to 3.653 beta is negative 1.337 times 10 to the negative third. Gamma is 3.294 uh, times 10 to the negative six. Delta is negative 1. Point, I can't read my notes here. Uh, 1.913 times 10 to the negative nine and epsilon is 0 0.2763 times 10 to the negative 12. Notice the exponent's getting smaller in each of these advancing cases, and it sort of has less and less of an effect. Um, if test time was crunching, uh, and for some reason I was cruel enough to give you a problem like this, which I feel like I don't want to do, omitting some of the last coefficients can really help save time because they actually start to play a very minuscule part in the um, final value, right? Because you have to look at this, that this is saying times 10 to the negative 12, which means it is 12 orders of magnitude a smaller effect than the alpha coefficient. What we are trying to say, in other words, is basically alpha makes up most of what this answers magnitude is. Beta is still a very important player. Starting from gamma and onwards, we really have hardly an effect here, um, except in situations where the temperature is absolutely huge differential. Anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, H2 minus H1 is equal to 632.5. That was super fun, wasn't it? And that's the sound of nobody agreeing with me on the internet. Problem two. Problem two states, ideal gas is expanded through an adiabatic throttle valve. Okay. The really important thing, I think, with all of these problems is to never lose hope and never lose sight of your methods of solution. This is an adiabatic valve. We know things about adiabatic valves. We know, first of all, it said adiabatic. Um, so I really hope at this point, you see Q is equal to zero. And what they're asking for is, does the temperature uh, increase or decrease when it goes through? So let's do the mass balance. It's all the same stuff, guys. Uh, nothing really should change, nothing should phase you. Um, if you use these same methods, you'll feel really comfortable. Uh, let's do an energy balance. And hopefully you guys remember this, but you know, we can do it anyway, uh, just to make sure from our general energy balance, what we're gonna be left with basically is zero equals um, the mass flow H1 minus H2. Um, or H1 is equal to H2. It's uh, isenthalpic. Hopefully you remember that. Okay, what ideal gas equation relates to this? Well, it's H, of course, it's an open system. DH is equal to CP DT. Okay, but when we evaluate the integral, H2 minus H1 is equal to the integral from 
T1 to T2 uh, Cp dt. We know h1 minus h2. The answer is zero because they're equal. So some number minus another number is equal to zero. So what we're really trying to say is zero equals uh, the integral of t from t1 to t2 Cp dt. Now comes some kind of interesting analysis. For whatever function is inside of this Cp, uh, we have to think of what values Cp can take on. It's not really a function, it's just a number. Um, Cp can't be zero, it can't be negative, and so we're trying to find sort of the area under the curve evaluated these two temperatures for a number that is not zero and not negative across two different temperatures. And the only way I know of to get the area of something evaluated at some at some constant uh, function between two different temperatures is if those two different temperatures were the same. So at that point we'd be evaluating the area of a line which indeed would be zero. And so we must conclude that the only way that this integral can equal zero is that t1 is equal to t2. So just kind of an interesting little bit of uh, mathematical proof. Uh, so if the question was, does the uh, temperature increase or decrease? The answer is neither. It stays the same. Six point one two two. Okay, 6.122 reads, argon in a piston cylinder assembly. Drawing pictures continues to be super useful in this class. Whenever I think piston cylinder, not only do I usually think, oh, this is probably gonna be a closed system problem, but I also think there's probably two states and you could almost save time and be like, ah, oh, there's probably gonna be something that happens to this piston cylinder is compressed. Oh, look at that. Okay, so we had some more of this stuff and now we have less in volume. Okay, good. It's compressed isentropically. Isentropic. One entropy. S1 is equal to S2. It's about reading each of those words. Isentropically from state one where the pressure uh, is 150 kPa, kilopascals. Um, and 35 degrees Celsius uh, to state two when it's 300 uh, kilopascals. Assuming the ideal gas model and that K is equal to 1.67, determine T2 uh, in degrees Celsius and the work per kilogram I'm sorry, well, yeah, work per kilogram of argon. And the reason that we have to do per kilogram of argon is they never told us how much argon is in there in the first place. So we have to sort of divide by the total amount of argon that's in there. So let's kind of break this down. What are the situations where things are isentropic? Answer, that they're <clears throat> adiabatic and reversible. So we know S1 is equal to S2. We also now can say that Q is equal to zero and we can say sigma is equal to zero. So you can see just with that one word, isentropic, if you miss that word, the whole problem is gonna be just hell for you, right? 
Okay, well, at this point, we got to try to do something to try to solve the problem. Um, now, I'm going to skip a couple steps here just because we have covered some of this stuff in the past. Um, so, let's take a look here. One of the first things we want <clears throat> sorry, want to do is calculate R as soon as we can because it's just going to be useful. So we can look up the molecular weight of uh, argon. R is equal to 8.314 kilojoules over 3 point, oh, it's actually 39.94 kilograms per kilomole. This is kilomole Kelvin. Okay, 0 0.2082 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay, that's good. Um, what else can we do? CP minus CV is equal to 0 0.2082. Yeah, okay. But we also know that CP over CV is equal to 1.67. That was given in the problem. That's what K was. Okay, well, we can actually use that to find all the other things that we need. CP is equal to 0 0.5189. CV is equal to 0 0.3107. Okay, good, good, good. Now the relationship. So, I'm not going to rewrite how I got here, but one of those cases um, that we can relate our two pressures and temperatures by this relationship. I invite you to read your book and see all of the situations clearly. So now we actually have everything we need just about, right? Because um, all we need to do is solve for T2. So all I have to do is move that T over. Um, and before I do that, I'm not going to fall into a very, very comfortable trap that they set for me, right? Because they gave me a temperature in degrees Celsius. So one of the first things I have to do is get that over... Um, to Kelvin. Write these things down. You know, I do give credit in certain instances for writing down such simple trivialities like changing temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. 300 over 150. 0 0.2082 over 0 0.5189. Uh, so we get 406.8 Kelvin. Is that our answer? Eh, be careful. They did ask in units of degrees Celsius. So we're going to further convert that 133.6 degrees Celsius. Fantabulous. Okay. So what's work in this case? Um. Looking back at our equations, there is a work relationship that is given to us. Um, normally, uh, what's work? It's basically um, the, in this case, where Q is zero, and that was a very important thing to be able to extract from the word isentropic work is equal to negative M uh, delta U. So, looking at it a different way, we have some relationship du cv dt. So, I've just basically plopped that into this equation, and now I can get work per unit mass, just divide mass to the other side, is equal to negative c. Uh, v delta T. Let's do it. Our C V value negative 0 0.3107 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times 406.8 minus 308 all in Kelvin negative 30.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Does that make sense? The signs will not lie to you. 
um, work as negative here. The gas is being compressed. Yeah, sure. That seems right. So, in the homework, it also does say rework for the isothermal reversible compression. So, rather than isentropic, we're going to say isothermal. One temp. Okay. So what they're saying is T1 is equal to T2, which is equal to 308. 308 Kelvin. Okay. Because, right, because we already said that energy uh, equation had some m delta u and because in the ideal gas world u and h are only a function of the temperature and this is by the way just from our delta u is equal to q minus w so here I just rewrote big U as uh, delta u delta specific uh, internal energy we know that this has to be zero because they just told us that the temperature isn't changing and we know in the ideal gas world that that means that the internal energy would not change either so what that means is if we write the rest of this Q minus W this is an isothermal case so Q is equal to W Okay, that's weird. So that was our energy balance. Now we're going to do our entropy balance. Delta S, that's delta big S, is equal to the integral of dQ over T plus sigma. There's no mass flows in or out. This is a closed system. We're going to evaluate this. 1 over T, the integral of dQ, which is equal to Q over T. T. Okay. So so Q is equal to T delta S. I've just rearranged this kind of a little bit multiplied T to both sides. And for more energy balance, W is equal to Q. So W is equal to T delta S. So these were big S's up until here, and I guess I should draw it a little bit better. This is a teeny S. Okay. What now? Um, well, we do have a relationship for this. Um, w over m is equal to T delta S. Great. Well, now we've moved the mass over, and now we have sort of the problem more or less where we need it, because we do have a relationship for that also. Um, T negative R natural log of P2 over P1. Look at your equations. You should be able to see it. Uh, and from here, it should be pretty clear as what's going to happen. Um, if you're not sure where I pulled this uh, craziness out of, by the way, in the uh, entropy balance, I suppose I should write that out. That uh, ds is equal to cp dt. I'm sorry, that's not right. Jumped ahead of myself there. cp over t dt minus r d p over p but let's think about this for a moment there is no change in temperature so that term has to drop out and that's how we get this term over here r d p over p 
At any rate, when you work it out, you should get negative 44.4 kilojoules per kilogram. I wasn't planning on doing that whole problem, but it seemed like the right thing to do in the context. Last but not least, uh, number five is problem 6.146 in your book. So it says oxygen flowing um, at 25 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals enters a compressor. Okay, we could do this. compressors consume work it entered in at 25 degrees and 100 kilopascals it is steady flow as it says next and exits at 260 and 650 kilopascals 260 and 650 kPa okay stray heat transfer Kinetic and potential energy effects are negligible. Modeling oxygen as an ideal gas with a K is equal to 1.379. Determine the isentropic compressor efficiency and the work in kilojoules per kilogram of oxygen flowing. Okay. So they want this, and they want this. So let's see what we're going to do. Very first thing, we've drawn our picture. We've written out our assumptions. Uh, it's time to kind of see what we can get by just playing with the numbers. Um, we're given k, so the next logical thing for almost all the equations, we're probably going to need r. Um, let's get r. r is equal to 8.314 divided by 32, 0 0.2598 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Great. Uh, we now have r. We know that Cp is equal to 1.379 Cv uh, because that's the relationship with K. Uh, we also know that um, Cp minus Cv is equal to R. So remixing, we're going to get Cv is equal to 0 0.6855 kilojoules per kilogram. Do you get comfortable finding CP and CV and R uh, in all of these problems? Uh, if you're really completely lost, that is definitely a great first place to start. If you don't have those, that's one of the first things you need to tackle. Uh, and CP is equal to 0 0.9453 kilojoules per kilogram. Kelvin. Okay, now... In a way, everything is very similar. Um, you can do a mass balance. Uh, just it would be more symbolic than anything because there are no masses given. But it may help you with the next little section. Um, just like before, there are basically two sets of equations that we should uh, come to evaluate, right? So we have the ideal and we have, or the reversible, and we have the actual. So we're going to have ideal here. And we're going to have a reversible. No, I'm sorry. That's the same thing. What am I saying? Ideal and actual. Sorry about that. Ideal and actual. Okay. So let's do the energy balance. Um, and I'm just going to blast through this because they're all very similar. So this looks just like what we just had our quiz on, right? I just took work is equal to mass times the difference in enthalpies, and I just moved the mass to the other side. But we do know what this is, and I'm just going to also write it right away. 
Hopefully it's getting a little bit more comfortable right now. Uh, and this is reversible. So S1 is equal to S2S. So in conclusion, and hopefully by now you can guess what situations you can use this relationship that I keep dangling in front of you. In case you didn't notice, this is a pretty important relationship. So we actually now have everything we need to do that. Well, let's not get too excited. Let's do the actual compressor. Uh, well, the energy balance is just about the same. It's just H1 minus H2, um, which is also Cp T1 minus T2. Uh, and we have a relationship with our efficiency. We could write out the um, entropy in that case. We probably don't need it. And the reason for that is they're not asking for entropy creation or anything like that. And you should try to be mindful of um, how to save time on these quizzes and tests. Obviously, you wouldn't lose any points if you wrote it out, but just saying it's not really that necessary. The other key equation that is necessary in this case, uh, this part of my screen is messed up, um, is the efficiency. Now, what's the efficiency normally? The efficiency is, this is a compressor, which means the most efficient case would be at the top, because that's the only way that this would be below 1. Um, of course, we can multiply anything by 1 and still get the same answer. And that's just saying that Ws over m over W over m is the same as that. Hopefully you can see that. You can just multiply by m over m and get the same answer. But we actually see these somewhere else, right? Let's go get my highlighter. Right here and right here. So we can actually plug those in um, because furthermore, when we plug them in, we actually get something very interesting, right? Let's just plug in what we see at the back end. Uh, where are we? CP. Okay. Well, do we really need CP there? No. These actually cancel out. And what we find is for our isentropic efficiency of a turbine, it's really just a relate, uh, ratio of temperatures. Um, so let's go ahead and find T2S, um, as it looked like we were just about to do over here before we got too excited. 298 times 650 over 100, um, 0 0.2598 over 0 0.9453 is all equal to 498.5 Kelvin. Now I can just plug those temperatures right down into this bottom part, 298.0 minus 498.5, 298.0 minus 533. We get our efficiency of 0 0.853. Great. At this point, we have our isentropic efficiency. We can easily calculate anything else that we need. Two ninety-eight minus five thirty-three Kelvin kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and we got negative two to two point one kilojoules per kilogram. So hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of a boost forward on this. Um, 
things that I would want you to know for the quiz that I would say are pretty important. Um, this relationship will probably come up. So hint, hint, if you have watched this far into this, you probably are in an advantage. Um, knowing your relationships, your efficiency uh, equations, and these basic relationships are at the very least pretty important. So have fun studying, good luck, and hopefully this clarified some things for some of you guys. Um, I really hope this uploads well, and I will see you on Monday for another exciting installment of Thermo.